join me in the call to worship. God breathed life into human beings made in God's image. We remember, so let's give God the glory. God called to our runaway shepherd, Moses, to lead God's people out of slavery. We remember, so let's give God the glory. God, like a pillar of clouds, led the people through the sea to freedom. We remember, so let's give God the glory. Water flowed like a river from a rock in the wilderness. We remember, so let's give God the glory. God gives us, God gives us a way when there seems no way. We remember, so we worship today. Join me for the opening prayer. O oh God, turn our faces, our voices, and our lives toward you, so we might know goodness, receive what we most need, and share the gifts of life with others. Amen. Today's storytelling is called Tensions in the Desert, based on Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 through 15. After God had persuaded Pharaoh to let Moses and the people of Israel leave Egypt, and after God had shown Moses and the people a surprising way to cross the water into freedom, there was still a long, long way to go. The only way to go was to walk. Day after day after day, Moses led the people of Israel farther and farther away from Egypt and farther and farther into the desert. The sun was hot during the day. The wind was cold at night. The people ran out of food and they started to grumble. They said, we're so tired and hungry. We want figs and meat and fish and cucumbers and melons and olives and leeks and garlic and loaves and loaves of bread and all the delicious food we had back in Egypt. We're dying of hunger out here in the desert. Moses didn't know what to do. So Moses asked God and God took care of the people. That evening, small birds called quail came so the people could catch them, enough for everyone to eat, so no one was hungry. The people grumbled, we are not used to this kind of meat. The next morning, fine flaky wafers of bread called manna appeared on the ground, enough for everyone to eat, so no one was hungry. The people didn't know what it was. They grumbled saying, what is this? This isn't fish or cucumbers or figs, and it certainly is a melon. Who asked for this, Moses said. It's the bread God has given you to eat. It wasn't what the people were used to, and it wasn't what they wanted, but it was just what they needed. There is enough for everyone to eat, so no one was hungry. God was taking care of the people. Hello everyone, hope you're all doing well. I for one am tired of the COVID, but I'm trying to be a good sport by distancing and keeping my nose inside my mask. I found this song in the movie Bernie, starring Jack Black. Jack took this song in a new direction from a church kind of gospel song. So this is Love Lifted Me in the style of Jack Black. Love Love, love lifted me. <laughs> I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the water lifted me now say am i love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help love lifted me love lifted me love lifted me when nothing Him I give, ever to Him I claim. 
in his blessings presence live ever his praises sing love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best song faithful loving service due to him belongs love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help love lifted So in danger, look above, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's a master of the sea, billows his will obey. He's the savior, wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love, love, love lifted me, lifted me, we lifted me. <laughs> lifted me, who lifted me, <laughs> lifted me. Thank you, and keep your mask up. Today's scripture reading is from Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 through 16. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by our flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. And that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what we, for what are we, that you complain against us. And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and you fill and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say the whole congregation of the Israelites, draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as the frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. I have my mask off for the sermon so that you might understand me better, but also recognizing I still have my mask 
and that we're doing it this way because Gary has left the chancel, so it's safe for me to speak without my mask on. I love this story of the Israelites. They finally received the freedom they sought after generations of slavery in Egypt. They finally had God make a way where there was no way. And God's leadership was so clear, sending Moses, the plagues, and then the Passover that allowed them to be free and literally save their lives. Last week's story had them led by pillars of cloud and fire out of the wilderness, and God even parted the Red Sea so that they could cross safely with the Egyptians in hot pursuit. Now they are free, and all they have prayed for for decades has come true. Last Sunday, we talked about how often in our own lives we desire signs like that that are so clear. God's presence and guidance right in front of us in a tangible, visible way. How wonderful it is to trust God in those moments when it's so, so clear. God's way making is not always as obvious for us as it is in the biblical story. So often our signs, our pillars are less clear. But I love this morning's passage and the next few that we will encounter because they speak of the fragility of faith. The reality that as soon as we get what we want, we forget where we have been and that God has provided for us. In our lesson for this morning, the people are beginning to grumble. They even go so far as to desire slavery back in Egypt because at least they knew where their next meal was coming from. Now we all know that is probably not truly their desire, but the uncertainty of this new future, even though it comes with God's guidance, and even though it is freedom and justice that they have longed for, that new normal is terrifying because it is uncertain. So God hears their cries again and does not let them starve. God provides manna and quail. Still they doubt and wonder. I love this expression of the fragility of faith. I have discovered that it is so accurate in my own life and in the lives of others I have known. I think also it speaks so directly to the moment we are in right now in this shared pandemic. The reality is that we always live with certainty, uncertainty of one degree or another. We are never assured of the future. And that is always a challenge to live with particularly for those of us who live with anxiety or desire always to control the outcome. And often those smaller uncertainties can be lived with, tolerated. We find a way to calm our hearts and minds, to trust in those day-to-day -day challenges of control and insecurity and anxiety. And they seem to pass. But in the face of a global pandemic, we are freaking out. And part of the reason we're freaking out is because, like the Israelites, we're not sure that we can trust God's guidance in this. We're not sure who to trust. Some of us rely significantly on the scientists and the words of caution and optimism. If we just do what's asked of us and stay the course, this will get better. And some of us just want this to be over. And so we cling to those messages of hope that say it's okay to resume life as it was. We all know how difficult it is to face the challenge of this virtual time. How challenging it is to suddenly work from home, to do schoolwork from home, or some kind of hybrid, and we're just tired tired of not being together in the normal way, tired of not seeing one another's faces below the eyes. 
Part of the joy of last Sunday's outdoor rally day concert on the lawn was just being together. And even though we were able to do it in a safe way, and there was great joy in hearing one another's voices in person, it's still not the same. Even though we maintained our distance and were safe, it was not something we normally engage in. And yet it was joy-filled because we were together. This has probably been one of the most difficult spiritual struggles of my life, this time of pandemic. It has been because I was not trained, nor was anyone else, to be a pastor in such times. The only thing that I can equate it, equate it to is serving a congregation around the 9-11 events. Churches did shut down for a little bit, and we weren't sure how to be together when the fear of terrorism heightened our anxiety. And yet we were quickly able to resume being together and caring for one another in the ways that we knew and understood. In person holding one another's hands, arms around each other, crying and praying and seeking ways to comfort. This is a wholly different experience. At the time when we need that physical connection, the hand-holding prayer, the comforting hug, the joyful singing, they are the very things that we cannot do. I don't know how to be a pastor in a pandemic. No one knows how to be a pastor in a pandemic. No one knows how to be the church in a pandemic. But we are doing our best to do what God has called us to do with the resources available. And here is where I think the parallels with the Israelites begin to come up. One of the things that I am most grateful for well, wait, let me stop there a minute and go back to the story of the Israelites for a moment. Remember, they were afraid, literally afraid that they were going to starve. And yet, God provided them manna and quail. And they didn't know what this manna was. It was new and different and nothing they had seen before. I was thinking of this message as I was walking with my dog. My shoes were wet with the morning dew, and I thought about that manna, and I thought about how even in the midst of all this uncertainty, the grass grows, and the rain falls, and the dew appears, and the sun shines, and life goes on around us. We have manna and quail in our lives, too in all sorts of wonderful ways. Even in the midst of this uncertainty, one of the things that I'm so grateful for is technology. I think about my training for ministry when we didn't even have cell phones or even an answering machine at church where you could find out what time the service was or leave a message if you were in need, let alone websites and YouTube and Zoom meetings. And I'm so grateful that we can at least hear one another's voices, that we can include lay readers that record the service for us at home so that we can see some faces. At the end of the service today, as I did last week, we will share some pictures of the concert to show the joy it was to be together, to see one another's faces. Now we, like the Israelites, can focus on the negative. We can delve deep into that uncertainty, and it can just ramp up our fear and our emotions. We want to know, when are we going to be back together? When can we see each other? And when are things returning to normal? And the answer is, we don't know. Our task force is so, so diligently working and providing input on when that is safe to do, 
And we've already had some small group aspects of the church open up in a safe way. But the reality is that even when we do come back to physical worship, it is going to be significantly different than it was before. And yet, God provides. I think about all the things that we're missing And I think that the greatest thing we're missing is the comfort of one another. In times of uncertainty, the church has always been a place where we turn for comfort in our grief, for prayer in the midst of our fears and anxiety, and for community in the midst of our loneliness. But we can still be there for one another. We can still connect And I know that that connection is not the same, but it is manna in our wilderness. We have access to the technology that allows us to create worship. We have excellent music. We have opportunities to gather via many means. It's different, yes. But one of the powerful things for me A great learning that I have had during this time is how wonderful it is also to rely on that old-fashioned communication. I have written more notes and cards and letters than I've probably ever done my whole life. And Becca and I had the joy of delivering those packages to our Sunday school families as we will each month, and we're going to be widening the circle of that when we come closer to Advent. But it was a joy to see one another face to face, even at a safe distance, even with our masks on. And even in those situations where we had to leave a package at the doorstep, we knew that we were connecting. And that was a powerful experience for us. So let's think about ways we can connect that are not traditional. I know that one of the ways is through the fine work of our mission team that has offered at least monthly opportunities to continue to be the church through mission. And we impact the lives of those who are hurting so greatly in this time of need. The other thing that I turn to is gratitude. I know that we're struggling. I know that there is so much we miss. And I don't mean in any way to diminish the powerful impact that our disconnection and loneliness has on each one of us. Believe me, I know well the anxiety of this time. But I'm also grateful that so far in the life of our church, most people have been well. Most people have had opportunity to connect, although not in the same way. And we're blessed with resources. Most people in our church family are still employed. They still have their homes. They're able to feed their families. And we're so very grateful and recognize the gift of that privilege. And so my challenge for us, for me, is to see the manna and the quail to see the opportunities and blessings of God for us, even in the midst of all this. One of the things I learned early on in managing my own anxiety was to not allow myself to ruminate on the negative. It only served to fuel my anxiety without any practical outcome. It's hard not to do that. It's hard, particularly when we're surrounded by messages that tell us that we should be freaking out because so much is at stake. So let's focus on the positive. We can be together, even if it's different and challenging. We have food on our table and blessings to share with those who don't. We have life. We're so grateful for those blessings. And most importantly, we have God who is with us in this. God who understands our fears and frustration 
and is helping to make a way. We just need to recognize that that way might require some patience. I've had many conversations about the anxiety of this time with lots of people, including my daughter, who is wired like her mother and extremely stressed out and anxious and depressed. And one of the things that I find myself saying to her has kind of become a mantra for me. So simple, I know, but try it. Calm down. Calm down. I swear I'm going to embroider it on a mask. Calm down. When we're stressed out and anxious and we long for things to be different, that anxiety makes us fearful and angry and just adds to our stress and division. It inhibits us from seeing the joy that's all around us. Calm down. Moses said to the people in the wilderness, God, here's your concern. God did not lead you from slavery to freedom just to have you perish. God will take care of you. Calm down, says God. I've seen us through many a pandemic, through many a crisis, through floods and storms and illness, and I will not abandon you. I will make a way. I will provide. You just need to be open to the way I set before you. May we trust. May we see the good. May we have the courage to allow this time to be a time of calm, even in the midst of the unknown. Amen. Please join me in the dedication of offering. Use these, our gifts, O God, to lead your people from death to life and from fear to hope. May our giving strengthen our trust in your power and loosen our tongues and feet to celebrate your glory in our lives. We begin our time of prayer as we have been with an opportunity for silence, to be still, to calm down, and to know God's presence with us. Let us be together in the spirit of prayer. Like gentle rain from above, so are your gifts of life to us, great God. In your mercy, you move our hearts from anxiety to worship. Like the sun that rises in the morning, so is the steadfastness of your love that provides for us. In your mercy, you move us 
from trust in things we've made to trust in your mystery and promises. Like a surprise gift, a bonus we could never earn, you offer us new possibilities and a chance to breathe again. In your mercy, you move us from fear to courage in your ways. Restore in us the daring confidence that if we take a break and worship you, if we stop our hands and our heads, that you will provide for us out of the storehouses of your goodness. May we have the imagination to feed those who are hungry and help the thirsty find fresh water. May we have the imagination to be companions to the sick, the lonely, and those in prison. May we have the awareness that you are present, even in our most lonely, fearful place. Teach us again to be your people as we pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have been fed by the stories of faith. We have turned our faces into uncertain places so that we may know God. We have been sustained in the rituals of community. We turn our lives back to the God of plenty. May the God of bread and justice accompany us. May the Spirit surround us with hope as we live in the way of Christ. Amen. Thank you.